Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 34, recorded December 14th, 2011. Bob Orban. Triangulation is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, visit audiblepodcasts.com slash triangulation. And by Ford. Featuring available voice-activated sync with sync services, which enable you to customize your driving experience with personalized news, traffic, and directions. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. It's time for Triangulation. Oh, I love this show. A chance for Tom Merritt and me to sit down and talk to some of the best minds in the business. Tom Merritt, hello. I haven't seen you in a while. Thank you for filling in for me all last week. Oh, yeah, it's fun. I always enjoy being on Security Now and Windows Weekly. And, and Twit, you did. And Twig. And, and your own show, so you, you're probably exhausted. I'm going to be gone again next week. We'll be working 12 days in a row. Where are you going now? <laughs> who's, who's the... Oh, right, you're the boss. <laughs> who's the boss here? Uh, no, it's just my... I'm. Uh, we... Uh, we, we, I, I thought yeah, I was going to be gone the week after Christmas. That's when we're doing yeah. our holiday break. You're going to be working the week after Christmas. I'm going to actually be working yeah. that week and not working the week, kind of half the week work before. Week. But thank you for doing that. Sure. If you weren't here, I, I would still go. So We'd have fewer shows. We, don't, we wouldn't have any shows. <laughs> anyway, Tom, uh, Tom it's it, it, always fun uh, to, to, to sit down and meet interesting people. And this one is going to be... Maybe a little out of your wheelhouse, as they sometimes say. Not well, maybe not. Year, but I've I've been around. You're an old radio guy. You know, yeah, I keep forgetting yeah. that. Uh -huh. um, so our guest, and I'm going to thank Kirk Harnack for this, a host of this week in Radio Tech. In fact, he'll be on with Kirk uh, next hour. Is a, a legend in the radio business named Bob Orban. Bob, great to have you. Uh, well, my pleasure. Of the Orban Company in uh, San Leandro. Uh, we are. R&Ding in San Leandro. The uh, main office is in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona at the oh. moment. And then we have a uh, Orban Europe, oh, uh, wow. which is in Ludwigsburg, Germany. How many radio stations use Orban sound processing? Pretty much all of them, I would guess. You know, I don't know if we have a uh, accurate number, but I would say it's in the tens of thousands. Yeah, uh, yeah. There are about... 40,000 licensed radio stations throughout the world, and uh, we've uh, penetrated a fair number of those. I, I would guess. I remember very well working at uh, first KLOK AM, then FM in San Francisco, then KNBR, and I remember the first Orban uh, Optimod was what it was called. We got, and I think that was at clock AM, and the, and the engineers, John Higdon, who you know, and uh, Dave Williams were singing the praises of this box. So let's let, but let's we'll get to that. Let's start. Uh, you're you're at Princeton studying electrical engineering. Uh, yes, and uh, I was also interested in the student radio station WPRB. Uh, WYBC. WPGU. <laughs> We're all in that, in all that same page there. We, really, this is a bottom. This is a bottom line for radio uh, universities out there. Keep those campus radio stations alive. Yeah, even if you have to stream them. They're great training grounds. Uh, yes. Uh, at the time, uh, entirely student run. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't take any money from the university. Uh, Seventeen kilowatts. Uh, class B, one hundred three point three. That's important because that meant that unlike most college radio stations, it was a commercial station. In yeah. fact, all three of our yeah, stations. I was one hundred seven point one. What were you? Ninety six. Ninety three point seven. Is that right or ninety? No, ninety. Gosh, I don't remember. You were rock one hundred seven. That's why. I remember. <laughs> ninety. It was ninety two. Ninety two nine. Maybe I don't remember. Anyway. Um, yeah, but those are those are commercial frequencies, so which meant we sold ads, and uh, it was really run like a real radio station, except for uh, the the DJs were all students. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I did a little bit of everything. Had a uh, classical music show in nice. the evenings once a week, uh, f I think for the entire time. Uh, did a lot of engineering, was uh, technical director one year. Uh, ended up uh, being music director for a short period of time. Uh, 
We did uh, rock and roll between four and six. We did uh, what were called standards back in the day. Uh -huh. uh, most of the rest of the time, there was late night jazz, uh, and then classical between, I think it was uh, seven and uh, 11. Wow. Yeah, I think that was pretty common in college radio. Yeah, mixed format. Uh, I guess it's uh, it, it lives on in uh, you know NPR sure. formats. One of the neat things about for for somebody who's interested in electronic engineering or electrical stuff is uh, college radio stations have no money. <laughs> they have ancient equipment. Keeping them on the air is probably a real challenge, but it's certainly a, a great way to polish your chops. Yeah, in the, in the case of WPRB, uh, they were on, I believe, 103.5, and uh, there was a little station, uh, WTFM, in Lake Success, New York, that wanted to uh, move and cover you know, new, the New York uh, city market better. Oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, they paid WPRB to change frequencies, and as a result, uh, they were able to buy um, a nice Collins transmitter and stereo generator. And I believe the WPRB was the first uh, FM stereo college radio station. No kidding. In the Fantastic. Country. It was you, the fall you, of 1963. You saw our classic Collins over there that Mike DeRoe uh, reconstructed, did you? Oh, yeah. Isn't that a beaut? Did it bring back memories? It's probably the same vintage. Uh, or close to it. What was it? At 820? Yeah. 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 So, you built a stereo generator, didn't you, for this? I mean, that, was this uh, your first foray into sound processing? Well, I built some audio processing for the station. Yeah. Uh, started out uh, just manual gain writing, and that turned out not to work so well for stereo uh, because you had to have a uh, faster uh, modulation monitor, and suddenly the peaks that... Uh, the old GE was ignoring would light the light uh, and cause distortion, right? And I mean. uh, that was illegal. And back oh. then, the FCC was very serious about uh, enforcing its rules and regulations, much more so than they are today. Probably a good thing. Uh, yeah, they they seem to have become quite lax. Uh, I remember having to take a test for my FCC license. Not anymore, and that, yeah. That, yeah, that's gone oh, away. Oh yeah, uh, everybody uh, tried to get their first phone. I crammed over a uh, winter vacation uh, and if you were really one of the cool guys you got the radar endorsement but <laughs> I didn't go quite that far <laughs> so that was in the ham radio you've got Morse code in in, in the radio it was radar yes. endorsement I'm not sure what you would, that would be good for but uh, anyway um, so y you uh, were trying to mo what keep the signal from getting too hot? Is that what you were trying to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, the uh, viewers of the show probably aren't familiar with the gory details of FCC rules and regulations, but uh, regardless of whether you're on AM or FM or television, there's always some peak modulation constraint. Uh, well, the peak Is that so you won't spill over into other frequencies? Or uh, it's a little it's bit just different aesthetic. in each one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. In uh, FM... The spilling over sort of happens gradually uh, as you increase the modulation. Uh -huh. You increase the bandwidth. Oh, okay. Uh, in AM, you can't pinch off the negative carrier because suddenly you're splattering over half the band. Uh, so it was much more critical to uh, control the AM negative peaks than it was to control FM. But uh, with the advent of FM stereo, the uh, whole peak modulation control technology had to get more complicated than it had been back in the mono days. People don't realize that FN hasn't always been stereo. That it was, that it was rel not recent, but about 40 years ago. It, maybe 50 it years was, ago it was now. 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. had a, uh, a great uh, panel at AES this uh, last fall uh, called uh, 50 Years of FM Stereo. I was on it. A number of other people were on it. I believe it is available uh, as a uh, webcast from the AES.org oh, cool. website. Uh, and until 1961, uh, FM was mono. Right. Uh, there were a number of different uh, FM stereo systems that uh, were uh, you know, uh, tested competitively uh, by the FCC. The one that won was the uh, combination of the GE and Zenith systems, which used the 19 kilohertz pilot tone mm -hmm. and uh, double sideband carrier. carrier uh, 
modulation for the stereo difference channel, uh, its big advantage was that it was very compatible with existing mono radios. Uh, the downside was that it got about 23 dB more noisy. So suddenly, you know, stations that had a good amount of coverage in their fringe did not have it anymore because the noise floor came up mm -hmm. by 23 dB. And the big advantage of FM at the time over AM was going to be better sound. So yeah, no, well, not only to make it wi wider frequency mm -hmm. response going all the way to 15 kilohertz at least. Uh, really? Some people think that that was the maximum, but in fact that was the minimum mm -hmm. in the FCC rules. and. Until we had FM stereo, you, you could very easily go up to 20 kilohertz hmm. on, on hmm. FM. Uh, and what was the low? Pardon me? What was the low frequency? Uh, once again, essentially unlimited. The uh, FCC required you to have a uh, response up to 50, or down to 50 hertz. Wow. Uh, that was mostly a te technology limitation of the uh, FM stereo exciters of the day. Hmm that use various uh, phase modulation techniques. Uh, once you had direct FM modulation, you could take the frequency response much lower. Mm. And uh, a lot of stations, in fact, did that. So you're really getting almost completely full frequency yeah. range. Uh, you know, Major Armstrong uh, tried to sell the idea to RCA back in the yeah. late 1930s. It was a uh, long slog for FM because of because they, they didn't think it was possible. They didn't think it would work. Uh, I think they were worried about their AM properties, which were the equivalent of today's television networks, very valuable. Yeah. Uh, There's a long history of resistance to newer technologies because you're afraid it will eat into the current technology that you've invested money in. Uh, and he, he ended up losing out in court, did he not? He... Uh, committed suicide yeah. before he won, but his uh, widow actually kept up the good fight and finally won a judgment from RCA. But unfortunately, the major was, a long was not, time later, was not yeah, around yeah. to see it anymore. Uh, the uh, pre-World War II FM band was in the 40 to 50 megahertz region, so one thing that slowed FM down was that they moved the whole thing up t to the current band after the Second World War. So all of the radios that had been built prior to 1941, I guess, immediately became obsolete. So not the first uh, frequency transition, like the digital TV transition that we just experienced a couple of years ago. Uh, that, exactly. That was ha all of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. Well, and then there was the AM stereo, which the FCC never did decide on a standard for and basically let die on the vine. Uh, well, you know, that's actually not quite true. They... Uh, they procrastinated, procrastinated a very long time. <laughs> they finally approved the Motorola sequence. That's right. System. They did approve the system, yeah. But for a long time, they had this uh, marketplace uh, yeah. idea, which really didn't doesn't work. work you need a standard. If you have three different radios, ways of doing AM stereo, and three different radios are needed, and nobody agrees, uh, by the time they decided on the Motorola standard, everybody had given up. We have HD radio now. What do you think of that? Uh, it's a very controversial technology, probably more so on AM than FM. Why is that? Uh, well, on AM, uh, it does uh, create uh, noise sidebands. And so in fringe areas, you can compromise the reception of other stations. And the FCC has uh, arranged it so that... Uh, the compromise is mostly outside the designated market area of the station, so they aren't really uh, entitled officially to coverage, but nevertheless, we're getting it mm. anyway. Um, and it's also controversial because uh, it's fairly hard to receive and the bit rate's fairly low, uh, which limits the fidelity to, you know, probably less than 120 kilobit MP3. For that's example. not so great. I mean, it's AM, though. So uh, that's pretty uh, good for AM radio. Yeah, it uh, does have much higher uh, frequency response. Right. Uh, it goes up to 15 kilohertz. Right. Uh, the uh, FM version works a lot better. Um, a lot of stations are using the uh, HD radio subcarrier to uh, 
2.248 kilobit right. per second uh, stream is one of which duplicates the analog so that you can crossfade between them. Hmm. Uh, the other which is a second program usually called uh, an HD2. Some stations are actually putting yet another one on. Uh, at that point, since you're only, uh, you, you only have a total of 96 kilobits per second available, mm. uh, the uh, quality starts to get a little bit ragged. Yeah. The uh, codec used in HD radio is more efficient than MP3, but not as efficient as HEAAC. Mm -hmm. So it's it's splitting the difference between the two. If you're, yeah, it yeah. uses the uh, spectral uh, band replication technology that's uh, used by uh, HEAAC, but from what I understand, the core codec is not as sophisticated. Uh, the the core codec has been considered an ubiquity trade secret, so nobody hmm. knows exactly what's in it other than the folks at ubiquity. Wow, that that seems kind of shocking that some one company should control. The, the codex for this. Uh, it was very controversial to allow this to uh, be uh, passed by the FCC without a complete system right. description. Right. Uh, Including is, what codec they're using. Yeah. I mean, it, this is it, by way of contrast with ATSC digital television where every aspect of the uh, system, including both the uh, video and the audio codecs, right. are fully uh, specified. Can only Ibiquity make HD radios, or do they license it out? Uh, they license. They have a, they have a uh, chipset that's hidden and obscured, and yeah, there's a a number. I think there's a couple of chi chipsets at this point. There's mm. a low power one, uh, finally, so that you can make a, a tra portable. Yeah, portables. Yeah, uh, I almost by, said a transistor. <laughs> yeah, Best Buy has an insignia, I believe. Right. Right. Is it too little, too late for uh, radio to this HD? Ra I mean, I, I wonder, you know, what kind of uptake there's been, and uh, I guess it, it always comes down to does GM Delco put it in their, <laughs> in their cars? <laughs> uh, you can get it in some. You GM can, Delco yeah. Cars. More and more so. I, I know our Ford Sinks have all have HD uh, radio in them, so Ford's put their money behind it. Yeah. So in many of the premium sound systems, uh, not only in the U.S. manufacturers, but you know, I think uh, Nissan has it and uh, Honda has it, I think. I'm not real sure. I, ha I haven't looked in a while. Uh, Toyota was a holdout for a long time. I, I'm not sure if they have finally offered it or not. Right. Well, maybe, you know, whatever keeps radio alive, I'm all for. Yeah, I it's mean, I don't know if it's too little too late, but at least it provides uh, more uh, variety for right. people who... Uh, More stations on the same. Yeah, it's the same bandwidth, right, per station, or yes, uh, it's pretty, not like the digital transition. Pretty much, uh, it is digital. Once again, there are these digital the sidebands side bands, that, yeah. that sound like noise to a, an analog radio. So, uh, FM radio uh, stations that are non-HD have uh, seen their uh, fringe area coverage compromised in certain certain situations, but. Uh, you know, not where they're actually officially supposed to have right. uh, coverage. I want to talk about audio processing, and uh, and we want to talk about the legendary Optimod, too, in uh, just a little bit. Our guest is Bob Orban, uh, who is a, a legend in the uh, in the radio business. But you also do internet processing, so we'll talk about. Uh, yes, we'll talk about that uh, in just a little bit. Before we do, though, we, I mentioned Ford. I mentioned Ford Sync. We've been driving, <laughs> we've been driving around all day in between shows. We, uh, Ford sent us the new 2012 Mustang, a 2012 Fiesta, and a 2012 Focus, w each with their own version of the latest versions of Sync so we could play with them. I just was in the Fiesta, which is kind of, you know, the affordable car. A lot of, a lot of young people drive Fiestas. And it, it, it doesn't have the big Ford Sync screen, but it has amazing variety of features, all of which come through audio. And I, as a, as a guy who's worked for, in, for years in audio, I kind of love... This so here. Here's the deal. We'll talk about the Fiesta. And, you know, you, you you get it in the you get the focus. You get the big screen in the center and the screen behind the steering wheel. I mean, it can get more and more elaborate. But the but the basic sync is pretty amazing. There's a little screen on the console there, but mostly everything is done without even looking at that screen. And I'm not just talking about uh, picking songs or making phone calls. Even GPS. There it is. Even GPS. Uh, you can. Um, they, they'll talk you through the ride. 
So, and it's got this thing called sync services. So the idea is you got your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road. That's the whole idea. Ford wants to keep you safe. And uh, there is on this uh, Fiesta, on the turn signal, there's a button you press. And it goes, boom. First thing I did, because I'm an experienced sync user, I turned off the voice prompts and I just have it go, boom. But you'll probably want to turn the voice prompts back on. Did you drive the Mustang? I haven't Mustang? driven the Mustang yet. No. Oh, would you drive home? I, haven't, the I, I didn't drive either. One. Oh, yeah. all right. Well, yeah, we're going to drive the Mustang. Yeah. Well, I'm going to think I'm going to drive the Focus home. Good. You, yeah. Oh, you'll like the Focus. Anyway, so the Focus, the button is like a paddle on the right of the steering wheel. On the Fiesta, it's on the left. Um, so you press it, bong, and uh, there are a variety of things you can do. But I had my iPhone connected via. There's a USB port. It charges as well as gets audio through USB. So it's digital audio going into the car, very high quality. But it also lets you control the iPhone, which is very cool. So I was able to play Pandora and Stitcher and all that stuff. And they've got this thing called Sync Services, which is kind of new. So you press the button, bong, and you say Services. Yeah, you can find out more uh, about this at uh, Ford.com slash technology or on the SyncMyRide.com site. Services, and you can get horoscopes, you can get weather, you can uh, it, you can tell it, you can set it up online at the Ford.com slash sync, and you say, this is my, where I live, this is where our work is, you, it, it knows where your commute is, and you can say, what's the traffic like? I'm going home, what's the traffic going to be like? Or I want to go to San Francisco, what's the, and it will tell you. You don't have to look on the screen. Again, this is all audio, so you keep... You know, pay attention to what you're doing, and it will tell you. It will. Uh, you can set up alerts for uh, traffic problems that will send. Not only tell you, send it to your phone. It'll text you. They have an app. Uh, it's just really a slick integration. And 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 I've mentioned this before, but the whole idea is your phone is more advanced. Your uh, you know the pro the stuff you bring into the car is more advanced all the time, right? They're iterating on phones every six months now. Uh, you can't iterate on a car that fast. So Ford was very smart. They created a way for you to interface directly with your phone and use the services your phone can provide. They have points of interest. Now, already 40 million businesses are in this. So, And it's always updated. There's always more. Your, your traffic uh, and, your, and uh, your weather and your movie prices, your gas, always updated. So that's a very clever way to handle it. I want you to try one. First of all, go to the website, Ford.com slash technology. They've got a bunch of videos, but all the different features, the capitalist, capitalist fuel filler, which I love. There it is. That's the website. The amazing engines. They've got uh, the, the EcoBoost gas engines, the hybrid uh, f engines and the Fusion. Now the new electrics. I'm waiting for the 2012 uh, Focus Electric. That's going to be my next car. Uh, and, of course, in the Ford's Ford Sync Technology and Sync Services. It's all there, Ford.com slash technology. And then, though, really, you've got to experience it. Go to your Ford dealer and drive one today. I was backing up in the Focus. You'll like this, Tom. And, you know, you know you're know, you probably used to having... Do you have a backup camera on your car? No, I don't. Oh, well. Yeah, I'm living in the I cannot 1900s. drive a car anymore. I mean, I will hit something. Because I gotta, I'm gotta. i too old. i got to go, oh, what's behind me? Get out of my way, you kids. But now with the, with the camera, you just look down, and they, they've added something. My my car has, they'll have these bars. It's green, yellow, red. Green, what is that? Is that your phone? Is that me? That's not me. Maybe it is me. Throw it away. It's... <laughs> I, I uh, you guys were using this as the uh, new Nexus, and you guys were using. By this way, this works. Us? <laughs> this this works great in the Ford as well as the iPhone. So I, I used the iPhone. I hooked up the iPhone uh, to the Ford. Uh, anyway, but I was talking about the backup thing. So it will show you not only where uh, your distance. It beeps as you get closer. It's kind of like the docking in 2001: A Space Odyssey. But it also, when you turn the wheels, there's these additional lines about where you're gonna go. And it somehow, it ties how far the wheels are. The lines are like Bezier curves, and they, and, and, they, and they bend, so you know where you're going. I mean, it, I just, it blows me away what they're doing. And I want you to check it out. Ford.com slash technology or your local Ford dealer. Mick says, I don't crank around to see what's behind me anymore. My neighbors have run out of kids. <laughs> That's terrible. Bad you joke. never know when another one might come up, though. It's, it's not the kids, really. It's the garbage cans. I have knocked over so many. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm in a suburban neighborhood, and everybody puts their, you know, they have yeah, three right. trash cans. They have mm -hmm. the long, the recycling, and the trash, and they just, they're huge. They take, so we got to kind of maneuver around them, and I'll tell you, a backup camera is great. I don't watch out for dogs. People in my neighborhood are always sure. getting their dogs off leash, sure. walking around. That's not good. Yeah. You don't want to hit somebody's dog. It'll no, just ruin your day. Horrible. And the dog won't be too good either. Bob Orban is our guest. Orban is a legendary name in audio processing. Started uh, doing this as a uh, uh, first ticket uh, in Princeton. Uh, helped that station go stereo, a college radio station. Um, 
Did you did you did you kind of how did you decide to focus on audio processing? Uh, well, I got into uh, hi-fi when I ah, you were a stereo geek. We were talking before yeah. the the show began. There's there's two ways you can go as a chief engineer: you either become a ham or a stereo geek, right? Yeah. So I was the stereo geek, <laughs> and uh, also I had a musical background. Right. Uh, I had right. actually written music for oh, my neat. high school choir and had some public performances back then. Uh, so between the interest in music and the interest in audio uh, and the fact that FM radio was a fresh new thing at the time, it just uh, seemed like the way to go. Yeah. Is, uh, t tell me a little bit about how you... This is still analog, right? Or these uh, are, We're talking analog technologies here. Oh, back, back in the 60s, yeah, yeah sure. You know, I mean, yeah. nowadays it's all chips, but... Um, so you're modifying waveforms? What are you... What are you how is this working? Well, our first uh, on-air audio processor uh, was uh, released in 1975. I had built some, you know, one-offs, mm -hmm. actually starting at Princeton, and then uh, one of the uh, station manu managers there and a good friend of mine, Lee Hagen. Oh, I remember uh, that boy right there. That uh, looks familiar. Optimod 8000. Oh, yes, it does. That, boy, you got that right up. That <laughs> is okay. awesome. That is the... Uh, Pre, that is the predecessor to the Optimod 8000 audio processing, except it uses uh, just pre-emphasized clipping instead of a high-frequency limiter. And it says, is this, am I correct, overload prevention system? Yes. So this is something important that you weren't really, some of it was trying to optimize the sound, but some of it is protecting the station owner against the FCC and overloading and, and splashing and, and all that stuff. Yeah, and back in the day, uh, the FCC rules were very important. The commission could, uh, you know, give you a surprise inspection at any time. Uh, they actually did look at overmodulation back then, so that was the primary goal. But the secondary goal was always to keep the broadcast sounding consistent and polished. Mm. Uh, Radio, radio is not an iPod on a shuffle, and it shouldn't be. Right. Uh, it's an entertainment experience. It's integrated. It has to flow. Right. Uh, the uh, individual elements have to mess, mesh with each other without uh, major changes in loudness or spectral content. And the main art of audio processing sort of combines uh, controlling to the FCC rules while at the same time doing this control uh, for consistency and the the showbiz fatigue, if you will. Right. Uh, it's a lot like a colorist in a Hollywood movie that uh, mm -hmm. you know, every scene gets uh, very carefully color corrected so that when you watch the movie in the theater, it all looks like one film. And and shading and things like that, yes. so it all is consistent. You're not going from some... And it really develops your yeah. taste because... Uh, for years, when I listened to stuff that was, I thought of it as flat, unprocessed, the dynamic range is all over the place. You don't have the big, rich bass. You don't have the perfect, crisp high ends. It just feels dead. It's, it's, it, to me, it's almost like a cook seasoning the stuff. You're making a, you're making a recipe. Yeah, and particularly back when we started, uh, Top 40 Radio was still yeah. very, very important. The boss sound. And, yeah. uh, Audio processing was an intrinsic part of that sound. It was compressed like crazy, yeah, right? Bring up the energy. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about so compression is one way you do that, which is squeezing the dynamic range. So the, the quietest stuff is correct me if I'm wrong, I'm uh, that's I'm true. speaking to the expert. The quietest stuff is louder and the louder stuff is quieter. And so that's all kind of in one range. That's what people a lot of times think of as the radio voice. The big boss sounds yeah. of the boss. Yeah. Yeah, although what we think of as uh, you know big sounding radio processing really started with the introduction of multiband processing. Um, is that like EQ? Uh, that is where you have uh, like a crossover for a speaker, and then right. after the crossover, you put a compressor in every one of the channels. So you know the woofer would have its own compressor, right. the mm -hmm. mid range would have, and wow. the tweeter would have. Okay. Uh, in our current processors, we typically use five bands. Uh, Mike Duro was a early advocate of this with the discriminant audio processor. 
Uh, it was three band. Uh, and you might have off. different settings for each frequency range. You yeah. might want to compress the bass more or something. I don't know. Is that is that kind of it? Yeah. yeah I was yeah. going to say the Ed, Ed uh, Budabaugh CKLW uh, was a early uh, proponent of custom uh, right. multiband processing. And indeed, for a long time, uh, there were a lot of custom processors on the air and uh, closely guarded trade secrets they were. Oh, yes. Because the Big 8 had its own sound, you know, and you wanted it, you know, if you're in Detroit and you want to hear the Big 8, you know, <laughs> you know, you're listening to CKLW. And that was a distinctive sound. KFRC had a distinctive sound. Uh, yeah, uh, WOR. You, did you work at WOR for a while? Um, I uh, did not work for WOR, per se. I uh, sold them a stereo synthesizer, which was the first, the first product that we done. I uh, had done summer replacement at WPAT. Uh, you know, back when it was uh, the major beautiful music station mm -hmm. there. Uh, you know what's cool is, uh, for a while, I was a big fan of air checks, and you couldn't get you know you couldn't get these air checks. They're probably privately traded with tapes, you know, real to real tapes. And now it's all online, and you can go back if you're interested in this stuff and you want to hear what that Boss Radio sound sounded like. Google Boss Radio, and you'll find great stuff on YouTube and other places, and you can really hear all this stuff again. Yeah, we uh, really liked uh, Dan Ingram. Dan the Ingram, ABC. yeah. It doesn't get much better than that. No, big Dan Ingram. And there's still a lot of air checks around. I-N-G-R-A-M. You can do a, a search for uh, big Dan Ingram. Um, is he still around? I think he is. Wow. Uh, Boy, I'd love to get him on. Uh, he was doing a lot of commercial and voiceover work in New York for a long time. He's, it's Squikipedia says, widely regarded as the best top 40 DJ of all time. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I yeah. could certainly believe that. Yeah, I used to listen to him, WABC. Um, so, what, what, why was the Optimod such a breakthrough? What did the Optimod do? It was more than multi-band compression. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, the original 8000 was just a single band followed by a high-frequency limiter. Uh, the big oh, breakthrough... I remember, I remember that beige face in the rack of every radio station I ever worked in. A uh, big breakthrough was that uh, previously the air chain typically consisted of a separate uh, compressor, and limiter like the CBS Automax and Volumax. Mm -hmm. Those would go into a stereo generator which had to have 15 kilohertz low pass filters because once we went to FM stereo you couldn't uh, go much above 15 kilohertz or the main channel would leak into the sub channel and vice versa. Uh, the 15 kilohertz uh, filters tended to overshoot and ring. This increased the peak modulation. This forced you to reduce the average modulation so your loudness went down. Yeah, you don't want that. So, yeah, so the, the big breakthrough with the uh, Optima 8000 was that it occurred to me that you could uh, combine the, in, the entire chain into one box uh, and the raw audio would get, go in one side and a so-called stereo composite bass band would come out that was the uh, signal that was the output of the stereo generator. Uh, it was actually, it was, gets modulated on the RF carrier, uh, and then, of course, the radio picks it up and runs it through its stereo decoder and picks up the left and right channels. Right. But uh, everything is basically done in that one unit. Yeah, and by doing this, we were able to develop a non-overshooting 15 kilohertz low-pass filter. Uh, and immediately, everybody could be 3 dB louder. And this was a very big deal. When you're tuning time. down the dial, you just got to understand, folks, there's 70 stations on the dial. You end up on the loud station. Even if it, you know, it's not how good just it sounds. You. It's yeah. just the loudest. It, is it loud in the same sense? Of, like dB loud? Or is it a perceived loudness? Uh, well, because of the push buttons in the radios, mm. uh, it was a relative loudness compared to your competition. It's relative, yeah. Yeah, that's so what counts. This was a big, you know, a, a, a big deal back when the uh, stations, you could have a maximum of, I guess, seven stations. Uh, On your push buttons, yeah. You no, know, I mean, uh, the, a single owner, I think, could oh. only have seven radio stations. Yeah, that's stations what's changed and, considerably uh, in those days. You know, now it, one company owns every station in the market. 
then there's not as much competition going on. So it doesn't matter as much. Yeah. No, yeah. but in, in this case, there oh, was it mattered. heated competition oh, between did it different matter. owners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they were looking for every scrap right. of, exactly. uh, of, of advantage that they could find. Yeah. Was the Optimod very proprietary? I mean, did you keep all that stuff inside Well, secret? we had a black box, a yeah. epoxy module. Uh, oh, really? At the uh, release time networks. Uh, we also had some patents. I, I you know, believe in applying for patents on novel developments. It uh, you know, helps keep us uh, going. You, uh, you had 25 patents. Something in the order of that. Yeah. I, I, it's hard to keep track of them. Now, they've I, expired now, right? Uh, some, some of them have. have. I yeah. still have some. Um, I'm actually still developing actively. Have you shared the secrets of the Optimod with the world, or is it still a black epoxy box? Uh, we never really shared the secrets with the world. It's like Coca-Cola. No one yeah. will ever know. You know, I think that people have steamed them apart or x-rayed them <laughs> or whatever. So, Yeah, I'm it's sure there's a lot of attempts to reverse engineer out yeah. there, for sure. <laughs> so... Um, uh, pretty instant approval of the Optimon? Yeah, I had uh, been working with a consultant by the name of Eric Small uh, who had a lot of connections uh, in New York radio and so forth uh, and uh, presented the idea to him uh, and he uh, said that he wanted to help commercialize the box uh, so we uh, engaged him and he was the marketing uh, grew for the first couple of years until we got big enough to move the marketing back in house uh, and he got it in all the right places you know once it went on one New York radio station uh, there was pretty much a scramble to get it on a lot of others yeah. did they just hear the other station and go we need to sound like that where yeah. do we get one of those boxes yeah I mean it's like holy <laughs> I remember watching the meter on the Aftermod slap. You know, you just you wanted to wa you watch it slap, and it was just like you felt the power. <laughs> and just looking at that, you want I want those three dB. So that I mean, that was the first of uh, I think five generations of FM Aftermods. The major technological breakthroughs actually were put into the eighty one hundred, which was. Uh, first uh, introduced at NAB 1980. Uh, probably my best invention outside maybe the idea of putting the entire system in one box is the so-called distortion canceled clipping. What's that? Uh, well, a clipper is like, uh, you know, a pair of diodes and you run the audio through the diodes and it clips off the tops and it clips off the bottoms and it sounds real distorted. And when you combine this with... Uh, Why would you want to do that? Because <laughs> uh, if you do it well so that you you know, just skate under the wire of what is audible, yeah. uh, you do not poke any holes in the audio as you would do with a compressor that had a slower attack and release time. So, so you're because you're still compressing, but instead of doing it by squishing, you're doing it by chopping. Yeah, in general, what happens is you it's sort of like a funnel. It starts right. with an automatic gain control, a sort of slow hand on the pot, then multiband compression, and then finally some sort of clipping. Uh, the multiband compression, if it's done well, will constrain the drive of the clipper so that the clipper does not uh, distort audibly right. or objectionably, sometimes audibly, but, uh, you know, but, objectionability but depends on the, mm -hmm. on the format. Right. And distortion cancel clipping uh, was particularly important for FM because FM uses preemphasis. Uh, basically, the treble is turned up, the transmitter is uh, turned down at the receiver. It's a lot of boost. It's 17 dB at 15 kilohertz. Wow. Uh, That's huge. And it's very hard to control the peak modulation caused by all of this preemphasis. If you just run it into a regular clipper, it tends to produce what's called different frequency intermodulation distortion uh, once it goes through the receiver because the receiver rolls off all the harmonics that the clipper produces, but the IM distortion which is typically in the range of two kilohertz and below, uh, can get, you know, un unnaturally uh, uh, exaggerated by the de-emphasis process. 
So distortion cancel clipping uh, basically removes the clipping distortion in some frequency band or another. And uh, the first one, it removed it from 0 to 2 kilohertz, which is basically the flat pass band of the radio mm -hmm. after the de-emphasis. Uh, typically what would happen is that when you were speaking through a clipper, every time you said an S, it would sound like a F because the, of the frequency components caused by the intermodulation. And sort of rounding off the sound then? or uh, Well, it, 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 I'm sure you've heard this in other contexts uh, because it happens in communications channels quite a bit. Uh, it doesn't uh, do much bad for intelligibility, but it doesn't make it sound hi-fi. Mm -hmm. It bugs you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, very inelegant. Um, and that allowed us to get brighter and even louder than the original 8000. <laughs> if you, when you write your biography, it's going to be the quest for loudness. <laughs> brighter well, our, and louder. Uh, <laughs> yeah, our, our, our motto is cleaner, louder, brighter. Yeah, time. I like it. I like it. We're talking to Bob Orban, uh, uh, one of the legends in uh, radio broadcasting. But the Internet is here, and I want to talk a little bit about Internet uh, broadcasting. Of course, you know we are processed very heavily um, by the uh, Omnia stuff. I think we're probably the only Internet broadcaster using high-end Omnia 1 processing, thanks to Kirk Harnack and the Telos uh, folks. Um, and I tell you, when we don't use the Omnia, I hear from people. They don't know what they're hearing. But when they don't hear it, when it's flat, they know. They, it's not as intelligible. I can't understand it. It's not punching through. And it's one of the things I think that made uh, our early days of our audio uh, podcast unique was that we were very, you know, from my days in radio, I really wanted to sound, I wanted to have that professional sound. And I don't think anybody knew how we were doing it, but now they know. It's yeah, well, of course, uh, we make uh, I know. Processes I know. Too. I'm going <laughs> to give you a chance to do your plug in a bit. And then we got to get you over to uh, Tort because uh, Kirk Harnack is here and uh, this week in Radio Tech is coming up. But before we do, let me talk a little bit about audible.com. We're talking about audio. There's nothing like audio books. It is, I tell you, for me, a lifesaver. When I got in that Ford and my, my got my phone, and as soon as I pair it, I start hearing the book I'm listening to, and I just, I love it. I get in the car, it starts playing, I get out of the car, it stops, and, I, and it's somebody reading to you. And it's, it's those times when you can't read normally. You're driving, you're at the gym, you're doing housework or gardening, and, and, and it's great because it gives you another couple of hours a day where you're filling your mind with entertainment, with information. It's just fantastic. It actually has made me do more cleaning. Yeah, do or more driving. do more housework. I sit in the sometimes I'll sit in the driveway and yeah. say I got to finish this chapter. Um, I, now I'm just looking. Audible does a lot of year end stuff. If you've not been an Audible member yet, I want you to go to audiblepodcast.com/slash/triangulation, and you can sign up for the uh, the gold plan. That's a book a month. First month's free. First book's free. So essentially, what I'm going to tell you here is how you can get a book for free. And there's the real challenge is going to be how do I choose among a hundred thousand great titles that audible does it's like the best bookstore i know you worked in a bookstore Tom. It's like yeah. the best big bookstore you ever worked at because it's, it's curated so i'm looking at customer favorites from uh, 2011 for instance um a new from neil gaiman presents they got neil gaiman gaiman uh to put together uh some of his favorite books this is a keith roberts book called anita um i mean there's just uh, you know they really program Audible. It's not just a, a website with a lot of books on it. And so, they're, they're getting a lot of exclusives. I, I, Ian Tregellis' new book yeah. premiering December 20th on Audible. Is that an Audible Frontiers? Not coming, to print, not coming to print until next summer. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I wonder if that's, that's going to be the future. Um, if the Neil Gaiman, I, if, I'm a big fan of Neil Gaiman's books. I would listen to many of his books, especially if you find the ones that he read. I just listened to American Gods where he does part of it and he's got some great information, you know, great to beginning and end there. But then it's a full cast production, so all the voices are by actors and so forth. But Neil Gaiman Presents is a selection from Neil of books that he's picked, matched up with the right narrators and, and, and recorded, you know, had the recordings done. So he's actually produced these books. So you know they're going to be fascinating books and they're going to be produced with Neil's unique perspective and uh, talent. Every one of his books is fantastic in audio. Uh, and this is from the Audiobook Creation Exchange, if you want to find out more about it. But now, here's the thing. You've got to pick a book. Uh, did you read Game of Thrones? You know, the new uh, next mm -hmm. season? We've got to get going here. What is it? It's called Storm of 
Crows? What is it? Storm of Swords. Storm of Swords. Yeah. So anyway, there's all six of them are on Audible now. Um, that would be a good choice uh, if you haven't Roy read the game. Of... reading them too. Oh, I love Roy Dutrice. He's missed in the fifth one a little uh, bit. He's but... re-recording the fifth You're one. You're kidding. They're going to put out a version Hallelujah. of Roy Hallelujah. Um, do you see this? This one, I think this, if I were picking a Christmas gift for you, Tom, I think you would like this. The Clockwork Universe, Isaac Newton, the Royal Society, and the Birth of the Modern World. Yeah. Isn't that you? Oh, yeah. It's right up Right my there. Hour. History of Science, 10 hours, great book. Royal Society just put their archive up online. Too. Oh, that's awesome. So this is actually what the Baroque cycle was kind of about. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can actually hear the history of The real world it. story of the yeah, Baroque cycle. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I can't pick one. I don't know how you're going to do it. But anyway, give it a try. Go, <laughs> your first one's free. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation and enjoy. You know, our gift to you plays on everything. The iPhone, the, all the, of course, all the iDevices, but the Zune, Kindles. Uh, in fact, Amazon owns Audible, so you know it's going to play on the, kin the Kindle Fire, for instance. It's a great. In fact, they've even got a special Audible app for Android and uh, an iPhone, and it works on the Kindle Fire. I could go on and on. I'm not going to. Just go to audible.com. Take a look, find a book, then go to audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation and get it for free. You are going to love it. Audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. Bob Orban is our guest. So internet. Did, when you hear internet audio, do you just barf? Uh, internet audio can sound really good, but you have to use the right codec. Yeah, I don't think uh, people really know what they're doing in, in a lot of cases. I mean, I'd like to throw out uh, Greg Ogonowski's name here because he is our uh, evangelist and guru when it comes to the uh, the whole internet uh, netcasting thing. Uh, and uh, if you use HEAAC at 48 kilobits per second, it sounds very nice. At 32, it's pretty good, except for a little raspiness at the high end. Uh, What's that codec again? Uh, HEAAC, formerly called uh, AAC Plus. Okay, okay, and uh, and so that would be for streaming. Uh, mostly, yeah. Uh, it's any low bit rate uh, digital channel where you want to use a uh, you know perceptual codec and uh, be very efficient. Perceptual codec is an interesting term. What does that mean? Uh, it means that the codec has a psychoacoustic model that tells it how to uh, throw away bits in typically anywhere from 32 to 1,024 frequency bands, depending on the technology. So, uh, so that's how MP3 works? Yes. It's a lossy compression, just like JPEG is lossy. You're taking data out, but you're trying to do it in such a way that the ear doesn't hear it. I remember uh, talking to... Um, uh, is it Klaus Maria Brandenburg, the guy who uh, did the original MP3. MP3 codec? And he said, we had this insight about how hearing works, that when one frequency is playing, your ear doesn't hear, there are related frequencies your ear doesn't hear. And we could take those out, and you wouldn't notice it. And that was kind of the insight that allowed uh, MP3 uh, to happen. And AAC is, is a Fraunhofer kind of follow-on, right? I mean, it, uh, I think AAC is really a combination of Fraunhofer, uh, Phillips, uh, Phillips. Dolby... Everybody. Uh, you know, the best of the previous generation, which would include MP3, A AAC is really a better codec than MP3 is. Right. Uh, has been tested transparent at 128 kilobits per second, which uh, That's impressive. MP3 never could be. Right. Uh, somebody's saying that Spotify and Rhapsody, compare the two, Rhapsody uses AAC+. I mm. didn't know that. So you should pay attention when you're subscribing, for instance, to a music service, is to, they don't, they not, often don't tell you. Yeah, uh, the, the codec makes a huge difference. What else? Uh, well, nobody we, uses an Optimod for uh, internet broadcasting. Uh, well, they? actually, yeah, they do. Do they? Yeah, really? You, you, uh -oh. We have a PC card that fits You're into kidding. a computer. You're kidding. Yeah. Uh, so you took everything in that box. <laughs> you come a long PC way, card. baby. Yeah, <laughs> no epoxy necessary. There's a PCI version, PCIe version, like uh, cool. five bands. Uh, the, the major difference in the technology between broadcast uh, processing for, say, FM radio and for the Internet is that you don't want to use any clipping with any sort of... We don't of need a, to. ...a perceptual codec. Right. Uh, mainly because you have no preemphasis, but also because the clipper introduces a lot of distortion products that mm -hmm. the codec then would waste bits trying to encode. So ah. we use uh, look-ahead limiting technology, which is a much gentler 
type of technology uh, that keeps the spectrum much cleaner than clipping, but is not really appropriate for AM and FM where you use preemphasis because in those cases the look ahead limiter would punch holes whenever you had a lot of high frequency energy. Boy, this so. is complicated stuff. The, uh, te the technology is pretty similar up to the peak limiter, but there is where it completely diverges. So do you have Internet broadcasters talking to you and saying, we really want that group? Is there, you know, everybody knew in, in, to in Top 40 radio what they were looking for. Do you think Internet broadcasters have that same kind of, we need... It's not loud. Or is it a generation of MP3 listeners who have 10 ears? <laughs> they can't hear a thing. Like, yeah. there, there's a real uh, education process that has to go on uh, to you know, understand that big-time radio sounds the way it does for less than intuitive reasons. Mm -hmm. And part of this is the audio processing behind the scenes. Right. Uh, that was my big revelation because my first job was at a 3,000-watt station in Bond County, Illinois. And I always wondered, like, why do we sound like crap? Yeah. You know, we sound cheap. What is it that right. the other guys do? And that it was it's compression. It's things yeah. like having an Optimod. We did not have one at that little tiny station. Well, I almost ruined my voice because I was trying to sound like yeah, Big right. Dan Ingram. <laughs> A little <laughs> cheesy can't, station. You can't do it in here. <laughs> you can't do it in there. Um, we're, Bob, we're, we're out of time because uh, I know Kirk wants to talk to you. Uh, this week in Radio Tech's coming up. And I want to listen because I want to hear the fight between Optimod and uh, Omnia. Well, hopefully it's going to be very friendly. <laughs> we're, we're just taking what uh, Telos uh, sends us. They're actually, we are going to upgrade our streaming to AAC+. I'm very excited about this. We're currently doing a Shoutcast or Icecast MP3 streaming. And uh, Kirk uh, has arranged for us to get uh, one of his Telos uh, streaming boxes, which, is, which are high quality. Uh, and will allow us to do AAC+. Plus. So we're looking forward to uh, offering you that quality. Thank you, Bob Orban. Orban.com, right? Yes, sir. Orban.com to know more. And uh, I wish we had more time to for radio it's stories. It's been great. Um, but I'll tell you what, there are going to be more stories coming up because this week in Radio Tech is just around the corner. We thank you for joining us. We do Triangulation Wednesdays where we've got somebody great like Bob uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, 2100 UTC at twit.tv. But don't worry, you don't have to listen live. It's nice if you do. We'd like to see you in the chat room. But uh, if you don't listen live, you can always download a show. We have audio and video versions available at twit.tv. High quality and low quality. Suitable for every device and every ear. Uh, so make sure you get that show. Thank you, Tom Merritt, uh, for being here. Right. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned. This Week in Radio Tech is up next with more with Mr. Orban. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.